The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar on workplace harassment, how to protect your company during the Me Too firestorm. This free webinar is available exclusively for our customers enrolled in our subscription services. I'm Leon Frierson, the Publications Coordinator for Personnel Concepts, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, Karen Jonas, who serves as our Regulatory Monitoring Manager. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest speaker today is Jessica M. Merlet. She's an international attorney barred in the states of Illinois, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. Before launching her own practice, Ms. Merlet served as the tender and defense counsel for the Southeastern United States for a large Fortune 500 mass retailer, and this provided her with extensive experience in litigation and legal consulting. Ms. Merlet's current focus includes serving as general counsel to small and mid-sized clients, providing guidance in areas such as employment law, business transactions, product liability, e-commerce and compliance, and privacy. Ms. Merlet received her JD from the University of Illinois, graduating cum laude and receiving the law school's highest merit scholarship. She has received awards for her excellence in legal writing, legal analysis, legal advocacy, and her teaching skills. Thank you, Jessica, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Karen and Leon. Today's topic of workplace harassment is particularly timely, as many high-profile men in entertainment, in politics, and in business occupations have recently faced sexual harassment claims as a result of the Me Too hashtag movement. Most of the alleged harassers have either been fired or have been forced to resign. As the movement continues to expand, Many employers are worried about the potential for devastating harassment lawsuits as more and more people continue to speak out about their experiences with harassment. Definitely, it's a timely matter. We are looking forward to discussing it with you. Today's agenda focuses on responding to and investigating workplace harassment claims. We will discuss the groups most at risk for harassment, types of harassment, and the equal opportunity Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's, or EEOC's, new best practices for preventing harassment. To help prevent harassment in the workplace, we will talk about creating harassment policies and we'll explore how employers are liable for harassment. This webinar also features step-by-step -step instructions on processing and investigating a claim of harassment, including information on EEOC investigations. We will discuss methods of disciplining guilty parties, handling requests for confidentiality, and addressing potential retaliation. Finally, we will offer tips for employers to help prevent and address harassment. The format for today's webinar features a series of questions that Karen and I will be asking to Jessica regarding responding to and investigating workplace harassment claims. Before we begin, I want to invite everyone in attendance to, to submit any questions you may have during the presentation by using the Ask Question feature in GoToWebinar. You can also post questions in the chat window. Most questions will be saved for the end of today's session, but those that are relevant to the subtopic being discussed will be posed where appropriate. At the end of the session, you'll have an opportunity to use the Raise Hand feature in GoToWebinar to pose a question directly to our guest speaker. With that, Let's get started with today's presentation. Karen? Jessica, a big issue in the news lately has concerned sexual harassment, with many high-profile men facing negative repercussions for harassment allegations. Harvey Weinstein was fired from his own company, and most of the men who have been accused of harassment have been fired or forced to resign. With all the news about harassment, can you tell us how prevalent harassment is in today's workplace? That's a great question, Karen. As can be seen by the momentum that has gained through this Me Too hashtag, and as well as by the delayed allegations, some of which are delayed by many decades, against these men in positions of power, the majority of people who experience workplace harassment, we find do not even actually report the experience. The statistics indicate that only 20 to 25% of cases are ever even brought to an employer's attention. Now, interestingly, while harassment is generally thought to mostly impact women, claims from men are on the rise. 
and they have increased approximately 10% from 1990 to 2015. Currently, they account for approximately 17% of all claims of sex-based harassment. Now, these statistics are in addition to other forms of workplace harassment, such as those related to race, color, religion, national origin, age, disability, and genetic information. Now, in fiscal year 2016, the EEOC received 28,216 private sector charges of harassment. These charges account for more than 30% of all private sector and 45% of public sector charges that the commission received in whole. Now, unsurprisingly, claims of sexual harassment do represent the largest portion of charges. Approximately 45% of all claims for both private sector and public sector. Now, these are followed by claims of race, then by disability, and finally by age. Since 2013, the prevention of harassment has actually been one of the EEOC's national enforcement priorities and is part of its current strategic enforcement plan. It received its own task force, and just last year, the EEOC issued a call for public input on its current guidelines. Now, Jessica, can you tell us more about the groups and or industries that are most at risk for workplace harassment? Well, Leon, the statistics show that women between the ages of 25 to 34 are unsurprisingly most at risk for harassment, especially for sexual harassment. This is most common in the industries of construction, transportation, utilities, technology, as well as for members of the US military. Now, also at risk are people with non-binary sexual orientations and gender identities, minorities, the disabled, and the elderly. Alarmingly, but unsurprisingly, there is a clear link between sexual harassment and sexual assault in the workplace, especially when it concerns male victims as well as a causal connection between sexual harassment and workplace mental health. And how exactly does the EEOC uh, define harassment? So generally harassment is a form of employment discrimination that violates a few different acts. So first it violates Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It violates the Age and Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 as well. And in its simplest terms, the law defines harassment as unwelcome conduct. And that conduct that is unwelcome is rooted in race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information. So the protected classes under Title VII. Now, in 2015, the EEOC concluded 18 months of intensive investigation by an interdisciplinary panel of 16 experts. And these experts found that sex, race, and disability-based harassment do form the areas of most complaint. Now, looking again at this term unwelcome conduct, we see that the EEOC defines it further, specifically in the workplace, as being unlawful when one of two situations arises. One, if enduring the offensive conduct becomes a condition of continued employment, so of keeping the job, or two, the conduct is severe or pervasive enough to create a work environment that a reasonable person would consider intimidating, hostile, or abusive. So for example, in the context of sexual harassment, unlawful behavior could, could include unwelcome sexual advances, it could include requests for sexual favors, or verbal or physical contact of a sexual nature that unreasonably interferes with the employee's work performance or which creates an intimidating, 
hostile or offensive work environment. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, what are the types of harassment that employers should be looking to avoid in the workplace? Well, in general, we have two main types of sexual harassment uh, or harassment in general. And these are two specified categories, which as we will discuss later in the seminar, each one has its own uh, different liability ramifications for employers. So the first type of harassment is quid pro quo or tit for tat. It means this for that. Uh, and it really, uh, we can look at it again in the context of sexual harassment, could mean, for example, the performance of sexual favors in exchange for a promotion or as a way to avoid a detriment, so such as termination. Generally, this type of harassment involves a power dynamic. So, for example, it's also the type of harassment that we see most often coming from Hollywood or in this Me Too movement. Uh, we have a female, for example, who wishes to have a role in a movie, who is told that she must have a sexual interaction with a director or someone else in a, in a supervisory role in the movie, or she won't be hired for that role. So the other type of sexual harassment that we often see in the workplace, or harassment in general, is a hostile work environment. Now, a hostile work environment can arise when there is a culture of offensive jokes or slurs, epitaphs, name calling, or even physical assault, assaults or threats, intimidation, ridicule, mockery, insults and put downs, having offensive objects or pictures in the workplace, or just a general interference with work performance. Where those things, are so pervasive so as to create an intimida intimidating or a demeaning work environment that negatively affects the employee's ability to perform. Now it's important to note that in this type of harassment, on the other hand, things such as petty slights or annoyances and isolated incidents, unless of course those incidents are extremely serious, they do not give rise to the level of illegality that is deemed to be harassment under this idea of a hostile work environment context. Now, it's important to note that regardless of the type of classification, so regardless of whether it's quid pro quo harassment or hostile work environment harassment, harassment can include a whole variety of circumstances. So it can include the victim's supervisor, it can include another supervisor who is not in the chain of command over the victim. It can include any agent of an employer, it can include a coworker, or even it can include a non-employee of the company. And again, the victim does not actually need to be the person who is harassed. Rather, it can simply be anyone who is affected by the offensive conduct. And then finally, it does not actually need to result in any kind of economic injury to the victim. And of course, you should all go, also go without mention that harassment can affect equally all employees of all genders, of all ages, races, nationalities, and other characteristics. Thank you for breaking down those types of harassment, Jessica. Now, <clears throat> has the EEOC released any new guidance or help for employers to prevent harassment in the workplace? Yes, it has. So as I mentioned, the uh, harassment is one of the EEOC's main focuses right now. And so in November of last year, it released a informal guidance document called Promising Practices for Preventing Harassment. And this report is based off of the findings of that task force that I mentioned earlier. And the task force identified and lays out in the report five core principles that have generally proven to be quite effective in preventing and in addressing harassment. So those are one, having committed and engaged leadership. Two, consistent and demonstrated accountability. Three, strong and comprehensive harassment policies. Four, trusted and accessible complaint procedures. 
and five, regular interactive training that is tailored to the audience and to the organization. So this report includes checklists that are based on these principles to assist employers in preventing and how in, in responding to workplace harassment. And the practices identified in the guidance are also primarily based on these checklists. Now, although the practices are, of course, not legal requirements under any federal employment anti-discrimination laws, they may enhance employers' compliance efforts. And really, especially with the EEOC's current focus and the current nature of uh, harassment in general, there has never been a more important time for employers to go ahead and to develop a plan for addressing a harassment claim. Thank you, Jessica. This sound like good recommendations for employers. Can you explain how employers are liable for workplace harassment? Yes, absolutely. So the laws that relate to harassment can be very complex and they are impacted not only by federal anti-discrimination laws, but also by multiple state statutes, regulations, and case law as well. So thus, it's critical that employers not only be aware of, on the federal level, the anti-harassment laws, but in addition, they really need to take special note of their own state laws, because those state laws may, in fact, more broadly define harassment and impute liability on employers. Now, it is also critical to note that an employer's legal responsibility to investigate harassment does not depend uh, does not begin, I'm sorry, only once a formal claim has been made. Rather, an employer who learns of potential harassment actually has a legal and has an ethical duty to investigate the matter further. Now, employers may learn of harassment through workplace rumors, through complaints by uninvolved staff who are simply concerned about their coworkers, or through witnesses, or even the involved parties themselves. Now, liability for a relationship that is not a supervisory relationship, um, where an employer was negligent, meaning the employer sh knew or should have known about the harassment, but failed to remedy it. Now, that in liability is imputed directly to the employer. Thus, any form of complaint can put a company on sufficient notice so as to create a duty to investigate. Now, on the other hand, in the uh, context of quid pro quo forms of harassment, uh, especially when they involve a supervisor that results in any kind of negative employment action, so such as the employee being terminated or a failure to promote or to hire or the employee suffering a loss of wages, that for that, employers are going to be strictly or automatically liable unless an employer can prove, one, that it reasonably tried to prevent and promptly correct the behavior, or two, that the employee unreasonably failed to take advantage of any preventative or corrective opportunities that were provided to the employee by the employer. So thus, quick and appropriate responses to claims not only lessen employers' potential liability exposure, but they can also mitigate adverse publicity, they can raise workplace morale, and create a more tolerant workforce in whole. So if you can, um, Jessica, what would you recommend as a first step to prevent harassment in the workplace? Well, that's a great question. And as a starting point, employers need to look at their own policies and at their own handbooks and their own training resources to address any claims. And for this reason, it's imperative that all employers, regardless of size, have clear written anti-harassment policies on which every employee has been trained and has also not only been trained, but frequently refreshed. At a minimum, we want to see that these policies set forth the following reporting and investigative procedures. So first, a policy needs to have the appointment of the key employee who will process all claims of harassment and who will act as a point of contact for any concerned individuals. 
with whom they can speak before, during, and after an investigation. Now, preferably, this would be a dedicated human resources manager who is responsible for all employee matters. Now, in the event the appointed employee is not one of the involved parties, or I'm sorry, in the event the appointed employee is one of the involved parties, the company should ensure that it has in place a secondary reporting policy. So such as to the next higher ranking manager above the employ appointed employee. Secondly, we also want to see that all policies encourage employees to report incidents of harassment as soon as possible and also assure them that no retaliation will be tolerated against any person who does report harassment. Third, the policies should also have a notice that a written report is going to be taken and the written report needs to have the following information. First, it needs to have the name, the department, and the position of the involved parties. Second, it needs to have a description of the incident including dates, locations, and potential witnesses. There needs to be documentation of the effect of the incident on the complainant's ability to perform his or her job. We want to have documentation of what steps, if any, the complaining employee took to stop or prevent the harassment. Then we want to have the names of witnesses or other individuals who may have knowledge of the incident or who may have also experienced similar harassment. And finally, we want to have the report contain any other pertinent information that may be helpful in investigating the claim. Next, of key importance, is that we want to uh, ensure that the policies also set forth the disciplinary procedures that may occur in the incident of harassment or a claim of harassment. And finally, uh, fifth, these policies also need to set out any state and federal remedies and resources that are available to harassed employees. Jessica, are there ways that employers can prevent harassment from occurring in the first place? Yes, certainly there are, Karen. So it goes without saying that the most important step employers can take is to prevent harassment before it begins. As we have talked about before with personnel concepts, workplace culture and training for both managers and staff, and having a clear written policy that emphasizes a company's intolerance of harassment are key strategies that all employers need to have in place. And copies of publications and seminars on this topic are available upon request. And also, employees who observe that employers actually take matters seriously and who have been provided written guidance and who have open safe communication channels are much more less or much less likely to result to resort to costly public litigation than employees of companies who fail to acknowledge or fail to discuss the potential for harassment. So a holistic approach to harassment prevention should be every employer's goal. Okay, ma'am. Before we move forward, I do want to uh, <clears throat> let the audience know that we will be sending out the presentation uh, following today's webinar. So um, just take note that you will have the, the information for you um, um, after the, e you'll receive an email. Um, so don't worry about um, taking too many notes or anything. So that was for you, Amy. <laughs> and Jessica, if, moving forward, what steps should an employer take if they receive a report of harassment or suspect harassment is occurring in the workplace? Sure. So internally, employers need to first take these following steps upon receiving a harassment claim. So first, the claim needs to be promptly reported to the appropriate person. So if it was made to a supervisor or to a manager who is not that appointed contact for employment related matters needs to be provided to that contact. And because of this, it is critical that all managers and supervisors actually receive supplementary training 
on how to handle harassment claims that come to them and how to comply with the company's written policies. So after the report has been made, we want to then do a written initial report that complies with those policies and takes down that information that is set out in the policies given to the employees. Now next, and very importantly, the employer needs to then notify its outside employment counsel. And this is because claims of harassment, as we mentioned, can have very serious liability consequences. And these can include punitive damages as well if the harassment is allowed to persist or if a claim is not otherwise properly addressed. Now, in no event really should an employer attempt to navigate or to handle a claim of harassment itself without retaining outside counsel uh, whose knowledge of the complex laws surrounding harassment can assist with then evaluating liability, addressing the claim, and determining if an early resolution is possible. So after that, employers need to ensure that they have reported the claim to their appropriate insurance carriers. And this includes any employment practices, liability insurance policies or riders. And the failure to promptly report a claim actually can result in a denial of coverage. So it is critical to do very swiftly. Next, uh, generally companies want to notify the board of directors and other C-level employees of the claim if appropriate. And then finally, employers then would also want to consider whether notifying the entire workforce or otherwise addressing the matter perhaps publicly is appropriate. And this is especially in light of the social media uh, age and what we've seen from the momentum gained through the Me Too hashtag. So it may include, for example, hiring a public relations director or creating a carefully drafted statement. Thank you, Jessica. Can you explain how employers should conduct investigations into harassment? Yes, certainly, Karen. So during the harassment or during the claim investigation period, employee employers should promptly conduct the investigation first using a well-trained neutral party and do so in compliance with the guidelines that have been issued by the EEOC. Now, it's very important that if any portion of the investigation is delayed, that the employer document the cause for the delay in writing, because a failure to act swiftly and a failure to act in a serious manner can exasperate the issue and also importantly can increase employer liability. So as a practical note for employers, while the EEOC's mandates now, of course, only apply to companies with 15 or more employees, it is considered a best practice for all employers to follow those guidelines. Now, among other areas of inquiry, the investigation needs to address the following few items. One, there needs to be interviews done with the involved parties, so with other employees, third parties and any witnesses. There needs to be a review of emails and other communications. And in the present day, we see this extending to WhatsApp messages, to text messages, to Skype chat logs, all of that kind of stuff. We also need to have a review of the personnel file of the accused harasser completed to look for past misconduct and any past discipline. Of course, we want to preserve all documents, and those documents need to be preserved for a time period that the employment council will set with the employer. Then we'll determine what action should be taken, which may include uh, additional training and may even include discipline. And then finally, the employer needs to prepare a final written report and very importantly, give a copy of the report to the involved parties. And then after that, we want to see the employer take appropriate disciplinary action, um, of course, during the investigation. And this may differ based on the circumstances, but in any event, it's critical that the discipline that is given is in line with the written corporate discipline policies that have already been provided to the employees. So some standard discipline actions 
include placing the accused on paid or on unpaid leave pending the outcome of the investigation. Uh, also, altering work assignments or supervisors is necessary so that the party's conduct is lessened. And even if requested, we can allow the alleged victim to take paid time off uh, if appropriate. And then after that, we also need to take appropriate post-investigation disciplinary action, of course, again, if appropriate. Uh, once again, it does need to be aligned with the company's written disciplinary policies, and it can include a variety of things. It could be a written warning, counseling, further training, uh, all the way up to suspension or immediate termination. Now, importantly, we also like to see that discipline includes listening to the request of the victim in resolving the claim. Uh, so, for example, the victim may demand reassignment, an apology, or additional training. And then finally, we want to review and revise, if appropriate, the company's current uh, anti-harassment policies, and also to conduct refresher training on them for all employees. Thanks, Jessica. That was great information for employers. But can you explain the steps that the EEOC takes during an investigation of harassment? Sure. So if an employee go ahead, goes ahead and files a charge with the EEOC, there is a 180-day time period uh, to do so. And then the employer will have the burden to explain what has occurred. And this is explanation needs to be in compliance with the EEOC's demand. Generally, the EEOC uh, wants to see a request for more information, for documents, as well as a formal uh, corporate position statement coming from the employer. Now, once the EEOC's investigation is complete, and importantly, regardless of the EEOC's decision, a right to sue letter will be issued to the employee. And this gives the employee 90 days, during which time he or she may bring suit. Now, I think all employers probably are interested to know that in 2016, more than 80% of those 28,216 claims that I mentioned previously, 80% of those were either found to be meritless, about 65%, or were administratively closed, around 18%. So that being said though, employers should note that the damages from those remaining 20% or so of the harassment related claims that were found to be with merit, those damages that were collected were around $125.5 million in 2016 alone. And of course, that does not take into account attorney's fees or litigation costs that may further reduce the bottom line and which divert valuable resources away from employers. So as I mentioned, regardless of the outcome of an EEOC investigation, the employee still is going to have the ability to file a lawsuit based on both federal and state claims. And because of this, employers need to stay vigilant during any applicable statute of limitations periods. So specifically, while victims generally have six months to file a charge with the EEOC on the federal level, on the local state level, uh, these statutes of limitations may be quite longer. So they can range from 300 days or more. So for example, victims have up to three years from the last date of harassment to file a claim in New York and in California. So in many instances, we actually see that victims threaten or commence litigation against a company that fails to really promptly and appropriately uh, move to resolve a claim of harassment. So companies that face such ordeals generally seek to arbitrate claims or to just swiftly settle them instead of waiting out that long statute of limitations period, because such claims can have a great negative publicity and arbitration, of course, provides for a more quiet determination of liability. And importantly, in the uh, claim of harassment, it, it provides for a determination of liability by an impartial third party instead of by a panel of jurors 
many of which may have had their own negative experiences with harassment. Now, requirements to arbitrate such claims can be put into employment agreements, into benefit plans, into other policies uh, that employers, uh, that employees and employers agree to. Uh, and they, they also can be reviewed and they can be made binding by a qualified labor and employment council. Now, finally, I think it's also important to note that in addition to the EEOC, uh, other, other governmental agencies may launch their own investigations. And these can include state commissions and fair employment practice agencies. So for this reason, again, it's very critical that employers facing claims of harassment do go ahead and promptly retain uh, employment counsel. What are some precautions that employers should take during a harassment investigation? Well, when handling an investigation, it is critical for employers to take the claim seriously. While at the same time that trying to remain impartial and non-prejudicial to the uh, accused party. So oftentimes employers may think that a complaint must be valid, especially if it has been filed with the EEOC. In reality though, uh, we see that more than half of reported sexual harassment claims in particular actually result in no charge, as I mentioned before. Now, invalid claims, can be filed for a variety of reasons. And chief among them, we see that they are filed innocently, actually, by people who do not understand the law or do not understand the situation. We see, unfortunately, that they are often filed as a form of retaliation against a person who is just disliked by another employee. We also see that they are filed as a means to shield an employee from his or her own deficiencies in the workplace, or unfortunately also as a form of harassment and retaliation against the people who are the true victims. Therefore, it's important that employers do not make any determination of guilt or of innocence or undertake any disciplinary measures until a claim has been fully investigated together with counsel. So what should an employer do if it, is, uh, if it determines an employee is guilty of harassing another worker? Well, as a key component of an employer's anti-harassment policy, it has to be made known that harassment will strictly not be tolerated and that employees who violate the policy are going to be subject to discipline. And the policy should also clearly set forth that employees who are found to have violated the policy will, at a minimum, be subject to written reprimand and, for very serious or for repeated incidences, terminated and also may face potential civil and criminal damages and penalties. Jessica, you stated earlier that many victims of harassment fail to report incidents. How should employers re handle requests for confidentiality? That's a great question, Karen, because we see that frequently reports of harassment do come re with requests for confidentiality out of fear of being uh, retaliated against. Now, in such instances, employers should proceed with caution because while many complaints and investigations can be treated confidentiality, information may need to be revealed on a need to know basis or actually may be required to be revealed by law. So in practice, oftentimes the name of the uh, complaining party must be revealed to the alleged harasser and to any witnesses so that the claim can be investigated and so that it can be responded to appropriately. And to this end, it's imperative that the person who is tasked with receiving that claim not make any promise of confidentiality. Rather, the person needs to impress upon the complaining party that the company will do everything possible to protect that person, but that the investigation and the protection of the actual involved parties must come first and must come foremost. And certainly too, the employee who comes forward does need to be applauded which sends a message not only to that person, 
but actually to the entire workforce that the employer does take such matters seriously. Now, in addition, we often see that employees who learn that an investigation is ongoing tend to have many questions. So those employees and others who wish to assist or to add statements need to be referred to a single point of contact. In no event should staff or managers or other employees be permitted to discuss the investigation amongst themselves. And then of course, files and reports that are about harassment claims should be kept se separate and should be kept secure from other personnel files and must be kept in accordance with local and state uh, record keeping laws. Thanks for that, Jessica. And I hope that answers your question, Maria, regarding uh, employees not wanting to write down statements. So it may be required that they come forward by law and employers cannot, um, they cannot confirm confidentiality in those situations. So moving forward, um, Jessica, how should employers address retaliation claims? So hands in hand with the concerns about confidentiality, companies really must be aware that retaliation does oftentimes occur against people who report harassment. And it occurs in a few ways. So we have professional retaliation, such as being denied a promotion, social retaliation, such as being ignored by other coworkers, and administrative retaliation, so such as being reassigned. Now, to that end, managers and key employees who are aware of the claim really need to take extra care to watch for uh, signs of retaliation or of further discrimination or of bullying. And all people involved, including the actual complaining employee, uh, the victim, the accused, and witnesses, need to be assured both verbally and importantly in writing that no retaliation or unlawful harassment will be tolerated. And they also need to be encouraged to go ahead and report any such instances to the employer. And if it does occur, of course, such retaliation needs to be immediately addressed for ethical and for legal reasons. Now, in addition, it is important to assist, insist that the accused have absolutely no contact with the alleged victim during the investigation period in any kind of a way that may be construed as uh, being a form of retaliation. Now, actually, it's commonplace for an accused uh, employee to be terminated during the course of an investigation because that accused employee sought to uh, speak to and to work things out with the victim. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, what are some other considerations for employers concerning harassment? Well, in addition to the liability concerns that we've discussed, employers should be aware that harassment may have other serious impacts on the workplace. Now, of course, we have the public fallout from the claim of her, uh, harassment, in particular uh, related to claims of sexual harassment. And this public fallout really can have devastating effects on companies. For example, we can look to the fate of Uber. And Uber, it managed to survive wage protests. It managed to survive customer outrage over surcharges and ghost fares. It survived its CEO's position on Trump's advisory team. It survived all of that until a female software engineer published an article that accused that same CEO of sexism and of creating and allowing to persist a culture of sexual harassment. Those allegations led to the firing of more than 20 employees and are uh, rumored actually to be the focus of a new movie. So in addition to the public fallout, uh, companies with corporate cultures that tolerate harassment or even that tolerate other inappropriate behaviors have a workforce that suffers from higher rates of physical and psychological issues and occupational and employment related distresses. So of course, as we've talked about on other seminars, employers have a direct investment in preventing such results because they can create, uh, they can cause great financial and resource strain, have legal costs, increased employee turnover, and decreased workplace performance. 
Actually, the numbers show us that employers spend approximately seven weeks a year, or 13% of the annual work time, dealing with managing employee interactions and fallout from such negative interactions. So to combat this and to create a more welcoming corporate culture, the EEOC actually recommends a shift in workplace uh, font by fostering an it's on us mentality. And what is clear is that much of the traditional training that is being conducted in the area of preventing harassment has actually been ineffective given its focus on compliance-based initiatives specifically to simply avoid legal liability instead of addressing and correcting the root problem. So by shifting the mentality underlying such initiatives and such trainings, the EEOC hopes that employers may move towards a more holistic approach in addressing workplace harassment claims. And among these areas of potential training, the EEOC actually recommends uh, civility and bystander intervention trainings to be the most critical to improvement of future statistics related to harassment. Uh, thanks again for that information, Jessica. Now, in closing, do you have any final tips for employers? I sure do. So first, you should evaluate your current policies. Revisit and revise, if necessary, your anti-harassment policies and trainings, and consider, as I just mentioned, incorporating workplace civility and bystander intervention training. Second, you should educate your employees and managers about how to notice and report harassment, and specifically educate also your managers about how to process and how to investigate claims. Third, be consistent. So investigate all claims the same. Even if at first a claim appears to be absolutely without merit, uh, because preventing a negative atmosphere to persist can carry, can carry serious risk of liability for employers. Fourth, encourage open communication. Encourage your employees to speak up and to notify you if they notice any form of harassment whether or not they themselves are involved. Foster a safe, open workforce, free of potential fears of retaliation against those who speak out. And of course, finally, consult a labor and employment attorney in your state and also the EEOC with any questions, comments, or concerns that you may have about how to prevent and investigate workplace harassment. Thank you, Jessica, for reviewing this information with us. Uh, before we end today's session, let's take a moment to answer some questions from our audience that were submitted during the presentation. Leon will ask the questions on behalf of our attendees. Hello, audience. First off, I do want to thank you guys for submitting any questions. If you do have any last minute questions, go ahead and submit them now. We'll do our best to fit them in before the end of the presentation. Um, I do want to start off by asking a question I got from our audience here uh, regarding the um, liability insurance. Now, is it required for employers to carry liable, uh, liability employment practices insurance? And um, if so, are there any like federal mandates, state laws, and how would they go about that? Sure, so every company that has even uh, one employee really is required by state law, and every state does require this, to have workers' compensation insurance. And as part of workers' compensation insurance, uh, the policies are going to have employer liability insurance, and that is what is going to cover and step in in instances such as uh, harassment. Perfect, thank you. And I do have a, um, <clears throat> another question from Anya. Uh, she's in our audience. Uh, she asks, how should the accused and accuser be treated once a complaint has happened and in, in the investigation has not been completed? Uh, should they be separated? Uh, and I know we did discuss reassignment and leave, so if you could reiterate that and then also expand on any protections for uh, the accused. Sure. So generally it's best if we can separate the parties that we go ahead and do that. Of course, it's not a requirement, um, although depending on the circumstances, uh, that may be warranted. But it's not a requirement that the two be separated. 
uh, but we would like to see it. If the, uh, if the victim does request to be separated, generally you're going to want to go ahead and honor that. Um, the other thing that we do see, as I mentioned, is that a lot of times if the parties are not separated, the uh, accused will try to talk to or to work things out, as you may say, with the victim. So we want to make sure that, that, uh, that hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, because it can only make the situation worse. And of course, at this point, the employer really has much more of a uh, much more of a responsibility to be watching the situation and ensuring that no other types of harassment or or assault even are able to occur. So we want to make sure that they are separate if possible. Thanks again. And staying in that same uh, topic or that same vein about the accused, um, I have a couple questions from Trisha and Daniel. Trisha asked, um, how do you handle after investigation a false claim of the accused? So are there any repercussions for the accuser or how would you go about that situation? Mm -hmm. So well, as we mentioned, this is actually something that happens quite, quite a lot. And um, unfortunately, of course, more than, more than we would like to see. Um, and really, it's going to depend on what the, uh, the false claim, uh, how did it arise, right? Because we see, uh, for example, false claims arising simply because there is another employee who maybe doesn't understand the circumstance or doesn't understand the nature of, of what is going on, right? Uh, or it may be a false claim that is in and of itself retaliatory or, um, or as I mentioned, oftentimes to simply shield someone because their own work is uh, not up to par. So it's one going to depend on what the, uh, you know, what the circumstance was right what gave rise to it if it is the later if it's if it's one that is uh, based in retaliation or to shield an employee from his or her own subpar work performance that does need to be taken seriously and here's again where you want to look at your policies uh, your written disciplinary policies of course that may be something that is grounds for immediate termination and of course, it also you know, may give rise again to some kind of uh, action or not liability for an employer, but personal civil action from the accused. So that's also something that can be considered. I wouldn't necessarily suggest anyone suggest that, but that is another uh, situation that can arise. Thanks again, Jessica. And uh, uh, I did mention the question from Daniel. I'm going to try to. Uh, <clears throat> mesh it with this question from Dave, it's kind of in the same topic. Um, Daniel asks, what is the standard of proof for a claim if employee A says they're harassed and B says, no, I don't, no, uh, I didn't do any harassing actions. Uh, and then Dave kind of alludes to that asking um, about, he said, she said conflicts and, and who's lying. Um, can you just speak to the standard of proof for a harassment claim? Mm -hmm. So of course, um, it's it is the burden is on the harassed employee right so it is on the person who is claiming to have uh, been harassed to go ahead and prove that uh, the hostile that the conduct was hostile abusive created a uh, workplace that was not comfortable etc so the burden of proof is there on the employee Thanks. And then um, I see this as a potential situation that could affect a lot of workplaces. So I'd like to ask this question from Melissa. She says, we've had some conflicts that appear to be uh, between generations and that the older workforce is butting heads with the younger workforce. Do you have any advice for dealing with um, without alienating either mindset that one's too sensitive or that the younger generation may find the older's mentality offensive? Um, is there any recommendation um, that you can to kind of alter that that work for, uh, that workplace hostility? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question, and one that maybe we're not addressing enough in, in this discussion that we're having specifically about sexual harassment. 
it, it all comes down again to the trainings and to the policies. So the more comprehensive that an employer can be in a policy, the better it's going to be. So we can see, for example, if an employer provides some examples in its own policy that says, okay, a uh, slur is uh, maybe not going to fall to the level of sexual harassment or things like that. And that actually, if I look back here at my notes, in fact, we, we did talk about that a little bit when we were talking about how uh, sexual harassment or how that unwelcome conduct is defined because of course it's not just about sexual harassment it can be for harassment in general and so if we have in our policies a very clear set out something that says unwelcome sexual advances not okay right um, or jokes okay things like that the more examples we can provide the better and of course the more training as well that can be provided the better Perfect. And then um, speaking of training, Army did ask about any recommended trainings and actually we're going to be giving you some information on that towards the end of the presentation. So just hold up just a second, Army, for that. Um, now, in regards to uh, Vanessa's question, she asked, um, as an employer, is it a good idea to have a sexual harassment hotline? Uh, in terms of a sexual harassment in, in employee or I'm sorry in company hotline I, I think that it's a good idea to have it in the sense that you have someone to whom uh, the harassment can be reported if it is simply as a uh, means of saying yes this is sexual harassment or no this is sexual harassment probably we do not want the employer to be giving any sort of uh, judgment on that right um, so if it is a means to take in complaints of sexual harassment and a way to uh, investigate claims, that is absolutely a wonderful idea. Right. Thank you. And that's a uh, great advice. And then just uh, to follow, um, <clears throat> just to wrap up, actually, I have one one last question from Christina. She asked uh, if you have any tips for small businesses with less than 10 employees in regarding to uh, following through an investigation so that they're not biased. If you could just give any um, any tips or recommendations for small businesses. Mm -hmm. So I think one important uh, thing to note, right, for all employers that are listening is that really regardless of the size, the uh, the investigation needs to happen the same way. The policies need to be the same. The trainings need to be the same. So that all doesn't change. The only thing that changes is, of course, what laws are applicable uh, depending on employer size. So even though the, uh, the company may be smaller, it's still important that we look to the, uh, to the policies that are in place, to the trainings that are in place, uh, and, and refer to those. And, for this in particular, if you are a small company, of course, there is much more, uh, not risk, but there is much more of a, a situation to arise where there is, uh, like you said, where there is bias or where there is even the inability, for example, maybe to reassign someone, where there is much more chatter, perhaps, about what is going on. And we simply want to ensure that everything is approached really by an independent third party and really you actually can hire these kind of people to come in and conduct the investigation and that's a great idea to use an independent third party so someone that is not so involved in in the day-to-day -day life of the company something like that is a really good idea as well as of course involving your outside counsel to ensure that everything is done in a way that is going to have the appearance at least, or hopefully also have the effect of being uh, as unbiased as possible. Thanks again, Jessica. Uh, at this time, um, we're pretty much out of time. We do have a few questions, very specific questions that we'll make sure to get back to you guys on. So um, like I said, unfortunately, we have run out of time and all unanswered questions will be forwarded to Jessica via email and uh, her responses will be sent out to all the attendees in the next coming days along with the presentation. I want to uh, spend a special thanks to everyone who submitted questions about today's topic and thanks to Jessica for taking the time to answer them. Karen?
Hi, we had a question for about training videos from Army. Uh, just wanted to let you know if you'd like more information about preventing harassment in the workplace. We do offer a variety of training programs, including our innovative workplace civility training program, which actually helps employers train their employees to develop civil behaviors to help prevent the root causes of harassment. And we also have a new harassment investigation procedures compliance program available. And this explains the harassment investigation process in more detail and does include forms and sample policies to use during a harassment investigation. Uh, you can call customer service at 800-333-3795 for more information. And uh, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for today attending today's presentation. We hope you found this information useful in understanding and preventing workplace harassment. Thanks again to Jessica for being our guest panelist. We look forward to continuing to work with Jessica on future presentations. And to all of our attendees, thanks for choosing Personnel Concepts as your provider of workplace compliance solutions. Have a good afternoon, everyone.